My name is uh, Daniel Stock. I'm a neuroscientist. And social interaction is what I've always been passionate about. It actually had a huge impact on shaping our brains. And in my research, I'm really trying to understand how social interaction is functionally realized in our brains. We are really special as a species. What are we, for example, doing here today? We are unrelated. We don't even know each other. But we are meeting at the same place at the same time. And the reason is most likely neither feeding nor mating. Have you ever heard of another species that can do that? In fact, animals don't even have friendships. But let's go back in time and see where this comes from. We are in primate evolution. Something happened that probably did not happen in most species. Suddenly, it became important to be really good at dealing with members of your own species. In fact, it became even more important than dealing with members, especially predators, of a different species. And this had a huge impact uh, on shaping primate evolution. So different from most species, primates started to recognize each other as distinct individuals. So in a way, they stopped continuously meeting for the first time. They belonged to a certain group. They were not only herd animals anymore, but they were about to become truly social. Now, if we think about how the mind works, it poses a new challenge on retaining and retrieving memories. Because by distinguishing each other, primates started to remember each other's rank and hierarchy, for example. Uh, primates could stop accidentally hitting on the boss's females. Primates also started to uh, remember which peers are genetically related to each other. So the important consequences now, by distinguishing each other, there are more things to remember in bigger groups. But the bigger is also the advantage. Most non-primate species react to peers purely based on current behavior. And there's no bigger memory load in bigger groups. Let me give you an example. Neuroscientists put monkeys in seven groups from one to seven individuals. So the smallest group contained one, the biggest group contained seven monkeys. So for each monkey, the number of housemates in his cage dictated group size. After a while, uh, the researchers took brain scans of each of those monkeys and they realized that actually those that were living in bigger groups had bigger brain regions that we know to be important for social processing. In humans, researchers also found a relationship between the size of our social networks and the size of our social brain regions. So improvements in social skills were probably a stepping stone for further inventions in social interaction. After fighting, for example, primates more and more often repaired broken relationships. They also temporarily formed coalitions to realize an overarching plan. Small monkeys learned to beat strong monkeys, so survival of the fittest turned into survival of the smartest. And also a prototype of friendship emerged. Genetically unrelated peers cooperated successfully for years. So optimizing behavior really had two objectives. The highest possible benefit for the individual and for the group. And this is reflected by how brain biology has evolved. The idea is captured by the so-called social brain hypothesis. It says that our complex brains cannot be explained by solving problems of the constant physical environment, but rather the complex and constantly changing social environment is what really drove primate evolution. So we are biased to behave in a cooperative manner. This is probably our default approach to everyday life. Many species interact in groups, but it is probably the unique human social skills 
that really leveraged human culture and civilization. Today, humans are able to put themselves into others' shoes to understand their thoughts by perspective taking. We have the ability to re-experience others' feelings by empathy. And those are crucial assets in everyday life's challenges. It also paved the way for the development of the sophisticated human language. And the many ways we deliberately teach each other. For example, we all know some mathematics. Somebody told us how to do that. And that somebody learned it from yet another person. This is how precious cultural resources are exchanged between us across distances and across generations. But how do we know what is important? By reading books or websites? It's faces. Just like in this very moment, we spend a great amount of time every day looking and analyzing other people's faces. Charles Darwin himself suggested that facial expression is actually a biological mechanism for sending social information. Note, sending. This is not an advantage for an isolated individual. It only makes sense in a group context. Trustworthiness and attractiveness evaluation are particularly important in everyday life. If you trust untrustworthy individuals, this can really have severe consequences, including death that is both painful and unexpected. If you do not trust trustworthy individuals, you're constantly missing excellent opportunities for cooperation. You might have missed to get to know your current best friend. And this made psychologists think that trustworthiness is fundamentally about categorizing people into bad guys and good guys. Now, attractiveness evaluation, on the other hand, is more related to assessing a person's overall biological fitness. And contrary to common belief, you would be surprised how similar you rate attractiveness in faces comparing it to him, for example. This is not only cultural, there's a biological component to it. The attractive people among us probably received uh, more attention from their parents as kids. Later in life, they earn higher average salaries, and we are all condemned to believe that they have better personality traits. Attractiveness evaluation might also be fundamentally about categorizing people into valuable and perhaps not so valuable types of people. But let's talk about what this looks like in the brain. We performed a functional neuroimaging study to compare the neurobiology of trustworthiness and attractiveness. And functional neuroimaging really revolutionized our understanding of brain function in the last 20 years. By measuring local changes in blood flow, we can infer where brain activity is changing in the brain. <coughs> and this allowed characterizing the functional brain organization in living humans during specific tasks. So the task we used couldn't have been any simpler. It just showed two faces, and we asked our participants to, to tell us, well, which one is more trustworthy, and which one of those appears more attractive. So the task couldn't have been any simpler. When we analyze the data, we are quite surprised because trustworthiness and attractiveness judgments were not actually that different in the brain. The brain activity pattern of those two social judgments looked almost the same. Most of us probably think that attractiveness and trustworthiness are like completely separate things. Well, those two social judgments probably have a largely shared neurobiological basis. But information we learn from faces can also be used for much more complicated types of decisions. 
And another functional neuroimaging study I'd like to talk to you about was on moral decision making. So moral behavior is a building block for our societies. And it has classically been explained by rational thinking. Conscious, controlled, effortful. Others, on the other hand, proposed emotion and intuition to really drive moral behavior. Unconscious, automatic, effortless. So many philosophers and psychologists either stress rational or emotional facets when it comes to decision making. And this is the question we wanted to revisit in the brain. To do this, we compared the brain regions that are consistently recruited during moral judgments to a rational type of social thinking. And this was perspective taking. The ability to contemplate others' thoughts and behavior by abstract inference. It really makes a huge difference whether somebody is acting by accident or by intention. Moral judgments were also compare, uh, compared to a more emotional type of social thinking. And this, this was empathy. The intuitive adoption of somebody's emotional state. We feel into what another person is feeling. So we conducted the quantitative summary of hundreds of previously published functional neuroimaging studies on morality, perspective taking, and empathy. There are three conclusions here. All the brain regions we found to be related to moral judgments were also related to either perspective taking or empathy. So moral judgments can be dissociated into cool rational and hot emotional brain systems. No part of the brain was specifically related to moral judgments. So there's probably no such thing as the moral brain region. And these results are actually unsurprising. Full-blown moral thinking develops after perspective taking and empathy on the scales of evolution and child development. So this is really in line with natural evolution in general. It tends to modify existing biological systems instead of creating new ones. So let's summarize. Complex social interaction defines us as a species. Human social behavior is really a direct result of brain activity. And I find it fascinating to consider that the complexity of our brains is co-evolving with the complexity of social behavior. Even in our current society, we did not solve many of the problems we have in social interaction. On the contrary, the number of social challenges is probably increasing. Just consider migration, urbanization, and culture clash. This makes me believe that social interaction is the most relevant psychological process we need to know about. It is potentially the most central aspect that makes us human. But we are dramatically limited in social neuroscience. We are too limited because we are sticking too closely to classical terminology. It is not successful in grasping functional brain architecture. And I really believe we need to break the rules here. In the future, a better biological understanding would also be a major step forward in psychiatry. More and more psychiatrists believe that psychiatric disorders are social disorders. And psychiatry is leading in terms of the financial costs for health systems and in terms of the life quality costs for the affected individuals and their families. Socially well-connected people with a lot of friends are happier, healthier, and live longer. So go, make friends, challenge your brains. <laughs>